I may need your help, Jerry, on this one. Water boundaries is not my forte. That's I was gonna I was way I was gonna kind of lead it off to for us in the West. <laughs> um mm -hmm. we had a, a lead Dreyfus who was our governor about 30, 40 years ago, uh said that you know up, everybody out in the West wanted to pipe water out of the Great Lakes because you guys are so dry out there in, your, in the Colorado River is like at negative values right now. Exactly. And uh, Lee Dreyfus said that they're welcome to all the water that Wisconsin has as long as it leaves the state in six packs. <laughs> Except I can't get a spotted cow out here, so. <laughs> I will say that with this, the storms we've had these last uh, couple of weeks, uh, February 1st, they talked about the snowpack on the Sierras. It was like 46%. And now it's, uh, as of last Thursday or Friday, it's up to like 156% snowpack. So, but the Rockies are only at 91 as of last week. So, so, so is it are all the reservoirs recharged out there? A couple of, yeah, of course ours. Of course, the biggest one that matters <laughs> is uh, not, it's up 30 feet, but, um, We'll see. We're we're getting there. Uh, I mean, I drove to the south end of the state, so I'm right on in St. George, the south border, which is you know it was a good five hour drive, and it rained the entire time and pretty heavy most of that. So we're getting some good water in here. Well, Trent, you think we're ready to go? I know this is going to be an off week just because we're on a different day. So let's let's jump into it here. Uh, again, I'm going to need your guys' help with this one. Uh, water boundaries is is not my forte. Um, in, in any areas in Utah where I've dealt with water boundaries, their artificial water boundaries means they've been established by some sort of take. And so there's a there's a deed that really does govern that boundary or they're going to be uh, canal and ditches and a few creeks. And generally speaking, those are going to be centerline descriptions up here. So that is the extent of my knowledge um, with it right there. We can end the class. So uh, we'll go through here and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it together and learn, learn together. Um, but let's just start with some definitions. And then please, guys, feel free to jump in with any experiences and, and knowledge that you guys have. So... Uh, he just starts in here. Let's just let's do some definitions. Riparian owners are those whose lands border upon a river, stream, lake, or pond. Land lying beyond the natural watershed of a stream is not riparian. Um, also, if there is any strip of land between the owner's land and the legal boundary of the water, that owner has no rip riparian or littoral rights. Uh, going back over here, littoral was a new word for me. Um, obviously I've read this before, but didn't retain that word. Uh, so it says the littoral owners are those whose bo lands border upon the sea, ocean, or great lakes. Whatever usage has been brought, has broadened the concept of riparian to the extent that littoral lands and rights are often described as riparian. So any of our, we don't have our, our normal California delegation here, but, uh, you guys, you guys use littoral in your states at all? Is that one we hear often? Jerry, with the Great Lakes and Wisconsin, I don't think I ever heard littoral out there. No, it, it's uh, generally the way we define it too is, is repairing has to do with moving water and littoral has to do with non-moving water, lakes, ponds, great, you know, the Great Lakes and that type of thing. Uh, but no, it's all collectively just thrown under repairing as, as a general category of stuff. Okay, great. Um, and then just a couple other definitions and things to, to kind of keep in mind here. Uh, just the next two paragraphs real fast and we'll get into some discussion. Um, in regard to artificially created water boundaries, such as reservoirs, the boundary owner is a riparian owner only if, as and when he meets the test of whether he has any riparian rights applicable to the reservoir by express terms in the grant to the owner. The rights of riparian and littoral owners are those rights which are acquired by law as an incident to the of the ownership of riparian and littoral lands 
or by conveyances in the chain of title to the bed, bank, shore, or water of the boundary waters. Such rights may include the right to wharf out to deep water, the use of the water for domestic or commercial purposes, the use of the surface of the water for boating, fishing, hunting, or other recreational purposes, the right to maintain certain aesthetic values, et cetera. So that's, that's our definition bank right there. Uh, the challenge when we get into riparian rights is it's going to be dependent state to state uh, when they were brought into the union of, of what was considered navigable, navigable rights then, navigable waters, um, and what laws were in effect when that, that came in as to how they are applied to that state. So uh, the discussion tonight can be very general in a lot of sense, and he keeps it pretty general here, though he does dive quite a bit into tidal waters in California, which was, again, another new thing for me. So I'd love to, to kind of discuss it and jump into that. Um, so as we do just get in, um, let's do this, like we've asked in the past here. Are there any questions or experiences that this brought up that we can kind of use to inform our discussion tonight? Yeah, I have some comments. I mean, I, I, I'm practicing in California and this uh, water boundaries is a huge part of our state specific um, LS exam. Um, you know, my experience is, it, yeah, it, it seemed really overwhelming before, you know, I think this this diagram that you have really sums it up nicely and it looks very similar to something that I might have used as a study guide for um, the DLS exam and um, you know it's it's really not that intimidating of a topic it's you just figure out where the boundary is and everything beyond that boundary is either state lands or um, you know some sort of public trust and um, you know yeah we, you said mention the littoral and and that applying to the Great Lakes and static um, static waters, but yeah, we we apply that to the ocean and and tidal waters as well, and um, and then the rivers for the rivers. I generally, it's a it's a question of navigability, and then I've I've been kind of helping a guy study lately for the um, the LS exam, and my my suggestion to him was that with the rivers, you treat it just like a road. If it's a um, if it's a navigable river, then you 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 know the ownership goes to the whatever it is, the mean high water or the low water I don't know it's all spelled out in code but then if it's if it's non-navigable then it goes to the center line just like you know our uh, private I mean our public roads if they're removed then you own to the center line so I think that that was helpful to kind of just take the mystery out of this because it, it really does seem complicated when you're thinking about navigability and low water marks and high water marks and all that stuff. Um, but it's really, you know, there, there are some pretty very simple rules to apply to all these things and just kind of makes it a little bit less intimidating for me. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of it's going to be familiarity, right? What are you used to dealing with it? And those of us that don't are just, you know, it's going to be overwhelming because we're not sure, you know, and you talked about, and we'll get over this to, in the next page here, and maybe we can just jump over there real fast, um, figure 41B. Uh, they've got a di diagram talking about the tidelands there, but there are these terms that we use, mean high water mark, mean low water, um, and uh, what do those mean and how, how do we determine that, right? So if you've never determined that or or I've talked to some surveys, well, that's an engineering thing, right? That's that someone's got to document that and track it and trace it and see what it is. And so how could I ever determine what it is? And, and Jason threw into the text 
the chat here, the Thalweg comes into play as well, right? That's one of those vocabulary terms that, that pops up on those tests and knowing what all those are, just defining them and understanding them can be a, a challenge for those that aren't used to it. Uh, so David, maybe I'll throw it back at you, you here a little bit is, you know, when we're looking at the mean high water, the mean low water, um, is there any tips or tricks or things you guys have learned or used to be able to track that or come up with those locations? Yeah, so good question. And, um, you know, I don't I don't really consider it to be an engineering matter. I can see why it could be if you're looking at, you know, um, where the water kind of runs and that sort of thing, um, hydrology, but, uh, my understanding of this, and I don't do it with a lot of frequency, but again, I did study this for the um, for the exam, and you know, we we run into it occasionally. Of where, where's the boundary here on this river or ocean bank, or we've also got these big bays that are tidally influenced, like San Francisco Bay, Humboldt Bay. Um, I'm in Northern California, so. Uh, but the, the the answer to your question is it's generally a, a vegetation line and you can look at, at photos of, you know, a river bank and you can see a dramatic kind of change in, in the kind of the upland vegetation and the vegetation that's in the in the water, um, the places where the water runs. And that's that's generally the, the tide line there is where that vegetation changes. And and if you look at enough, you know, several pictures of, of riverbanks or or bay um, or ocean, you can you can see pretty clearly where those lines are. And it'd just be a matter of running along those vegetation lines and and taking measurements and calling that your your high tide line or, or low tide line or whatever it's you know the case may be. Yeah, I did a survey just a couple of years ago, and it was for a, a flood zone way. Um, and it was kind of this this river channel, right, that only was wet during a, a flood event in Utah, which is, you know, maybe two weeks in the spring once everything melts and passes through. And working with the county flood control, you know, we were trying to determine what the risk to a home was, a new home to be built. And I can't remember the term they used. I wish I had, had remembered it before this, but we did exactly that. We It was a new term to me. And so we asked them, you know, well, how are we supposed to determine that? Or where do you want us to, to what do you want us to locate? What are you looking for for this? So we can get our elevation mark one for the, the lowest level of the home and then our distance from the, the channel. And, and that's exactly what they instructed us to do was go find where you find debris, trash, vegetation that's grabbed on, branches and you know the the roots and you can see this very clear delineation between you know what is normally vegetative area right that isn't affected by water and then area that would be part of that that normal channel um, i'm going to increase my screen size here so i can see what trent just threw up so he's got this this water boundaries description here a uh, general land title and tide line cross section along the Pacific Ocean. So you got submerged land, tide land, and upland. So between the tide land and the upland, that's what they're calling the mean high tide or ordinary high water um, and mean higher high tide. Um, and so it delineates that between the confirmed Mexican grant or original public domain and state sovereign lands. Um, and then in the book, it does talk about the submerged land, three nautical miles uh, from, uh, from that. And then mean high tide, alienable uplands and public access, public trust, mean, mean high tide and wave run up. So where the waves might run up, but it's not the normal high water area. Those are some great examples, very descriptive in, in being able to see, see what we've got going on there and how does it, to find some of these. So when we talk about tide lands, that's that's where, I mean, it's particularly in an in ocean setting, right? That the you've got high lot high tide and low tide that run throughout the day. And how high those go up depending on the time of year, right? And they're affected by the moon. And and there's again the extent to my knowledge, but 
you know, that that's probably a little bit more trackable or seeable one if you've spent any time on the beach throughout the day and the water comes in and out. But for us, us dry landers here, if you will, I mean, on our biggest lakes, we don't see a big tidal shift on things, you know, out here in Utah per se. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's a lot of information in this document. I just searched a couple images and this what came up as the, uh, what was it? The California Coastal Commission and California State Lands Commission Coordination Project. So it just had tons of examples in there, but. That's great. I, I like that. That's yeah. the pictures there. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound kindergartenish, but the colored pictures there kind of mm -hmm. help give clarification what we're actually trying to see and describe here. Water or well, water boundary <clears throat> is the only monument that defines a property extent, property rights extent that can move over time. No other monument moves. Okay. But it has to be slow and imperceptible. It can't be a sudden shift because that, that doesn't represent a, a boundary shift. So in Wisconsin, and it might be true in some of the other, particularly northern states, there, there are three elements that have to be present to define what constitutes an ordinary high water mark. Vegetation is just one part of it. Hydrologic <laughs> soil and the presence of water or the presence of water action over time is another element that has to be present there, which is why generally surveyors don't delineate ordinary high water mark in Wisconsin. We have a representative from the DNR do it or a specialty firm do it based on those three criteria. Otherwise, if we put on a subdivision plat or, or whatever map that we're doing, an ordinary high water mark as delineated by the surveyor, we're defining a boundary that we might be assuming a liability for uh, based on the ownership status and that type of thing. And, and whether people are actually, you know, informed enough about what constitutes the hydrologic soil and presence of water and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into that. And where it's really critical for us is not so much in the southern part of the state here, but in the northern part of the state, which is, we, we technically have more lakes than Minnesota does. They can be land at 10,000 lakes all they want, but we got more of them than they do. Uh, a lot of the stuff up in northern Wisconsin are, are lowland lakes, and you have shoreline zoning that you can only build certain distance within the ordinary high water mark. So, and, and that setback's pretty far. So you got all sorts of liability associated with these giant cabins, these mansions that are being built on lakes up there that are being built based on where a surveyor may say an ordinary high water mark is. But if the DNR comes in later on and says, now nah, you're off 20 feet, you assume the liability of an encroachment on that uh, zoning requirement uh, because you didn't delineate it correctly. So, uh, it, it can be a touchy subject. Again, they get, a lot of it's jurisdictional. What, what's common in your particular areas and that type of thing? So the experts that you bring in, Jerry, are those kind of like, in Utah, we'll bring in quite often like a wetlands expert to delineate yeah. wetlands. Very, very similar type certification or knowledge or? Yeah, I, I actually went through some wetland delineation training once and it, it there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Everything from looking at... Uh, the character of the debris, uh, buttressed roots on trees that, that indicate the additional support that a tree has to have in a wetter soil, that's a wetland type of soil, hydrologic soils and that, uh, digging down and looking for deteriorated parts of plants that leave behind an oxidation coating that shows that there's water there. There's a whole lot to, it is literally a science to, to determine where this stuff is. Okay. In, in California, it's simple, right? Because it just gets wet and the mud slides off and you wind up in the ocean, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, I, I tend to agree with everything you said. And um, in California, I mean, especially the, uh, the slow and imperceptible gradual change stuff. I mean, that's 
that 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 stuff right there is is an its own kind of science as well and then we've got to deal with that with regard to landslides and earthquakes and things yeah. too if the landslides you know it takes 20 years and the pipe moves downhill a foot then you know you might just say that's a slow and imperceptible change yeah. and hold yeah. the pipe but if it if it goes overnight then uh then that's what we call an evulsive right uh, movement and then you know that's that's a different ball game that that's when you reset the pipe in the in the correct probably record location and um and it's i think it's the same generally speaking with the uh the water boundaries is that if you have slow change um on a river or a, uh you know a tidal boundary then it's um I don't know that 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 stuff gets really complicated because you know it has yeah. to be natural if somebody you know there's a whole lot of stuff that 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 California State Lands Commission goes after people for uh, armoring uh beaches where and 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 you know and they look at historical documentation and how it's changed over time in the places that weren't armored and um, you know, and then you get the hurricanes that come in down in on the Gulf Coast, and they they take out big big chunks of beach, and then and you know, it depends on the state too, because they'll come in and and condemn the land and and take lots. I think in California or in Texas, so it's yeah. Uh, the, yeah the other big issue is navigability, because navigability affects the the uh, riparian rights. And then who determines navigability and what's the test for it? Now, again, Wisconsin here is a little bit different than other states in that in most states, a navigable body of water, whether it's a stream or a lake, the, the bed between the ordinary high water marks on both sides belongs to the public. Well, in Wisconsin, that's only true for lakes. It's not true for navigable rivers or streams. The bed of the uh, navigable body of water, the stream belongs to the upland owner, to the center line. So again, there's difference between states and how that's implemented based on when they came into the union and what their view of water law was. So I have something that I can share, just an experience that I had with some riparian boundaries. I mean, we were talking about a creation of evulsion here. Um, I had a, a client, well, there was, there was, well, this is, this is the Weber River in Utah and Trent knows Re Weber River. Weber River has very highly erosive uh, soils on both sides of the banks. And there have been court cases about the Weber River and uh, whether it's navigable or not, uh, whether there's a private boundary on the bank or in the center, it's, it's under a lot of dispute. But in this particular case, there was a question of whether there was uh, an accretion or reliction or avulsion. And it was some of the very things that you've been saying that the people were like throwing old cars into the river or, or putting heavy chains on, on, on trees on both sides of the river so that the, the, the river during flood season would, would tear the trees down and they would dredge the bottom of the river. There was even a guy who took a, a front loader and built himself a little beach uh on the side of a river and and you're looking at this and you look at the deeds from like the 40s and 50s and they talk about reaching a point at the center of the ri river and then nothing else about the river it's just at that one point at the center of the river and then you look and, and see some of these old maps about where the river used to be and you can see how the river has moved in in no less than 60 years and and you realize how much involvement the public has had how many flood events the level of erosion on the outside uh, and, and everything that's happened with it. And uh, and then I find a case that's just down the river where they said that if you can discern a noticeable change in the river within someone's lifetime, that could be considered avulsion rather than accretion. So that's, that's from the Utah State, uh, Utah um, Court of Appeals. So now I have a legal precedent. So it's not just what the DNR says. It's also, well, the court has said 80 years is enough, a lifetime is enough to identify avulsion. So that really complicates the issue. 
and I had to issue an opinion and, and record it. And it was ultimately so that they could come to an agreement, uh, this, this client and their neighbor about where the boundary was. But uh, I think I'll, no pun intended. I was trying to kick up mud. You know, I was, I was trying to, to make it unclear enough that they'd have to come to agreement or, or at least go uh, and, and get a, an opinion from a legal expert. And, and, you know, I got some attorneys to agree with me, so that was fine. And they ultimately got this, this agreement taken care of, but it, it was very interesting just how much people had it been involved creating avulsive events in addition to the natural avulsive events that happened on this river in this particular area. Um, so just my experience, I, I am not a riparian expert by any means, but this was certainly an eye opener. That uh, Weber River uh, was a part of a subject to another case that I looked at in Utah that uh, clarified some of the uh, some of the aspects of uh, uh, non navigable rivers. And from my understanding of reading the case <clears throat> uh, in Utah. Uh, navigable rivers are owned by the the bed is owned by the state, and non navigable rivers, the uh, the private landowners own the bed of the river, but the state owns the rights to the water and everything that goes in it. And before this case, the case is Conaster. Bree Johnson. And before that, there was some uh, question about just what the public could use, could do on the Weber River. Uh, it was clear from earlier cases that they could float the river. Uh, they could use other, do other things that were common to use of uh, water rights. <clears throat> but there were some things that they couldn't do uh, wading the river uh, without any uh, uh, connection to one of the rights uh, qualified for the river would have might have got you uh, arrested for trespass. Uh, and this case that I quoted here overturned some of that and uh, clarified that uh, at least in Utah, uh, non navigable rivers, uh, the water is owned uh, the, by the state. And uh, even, even uh, it, if you have a navigable river, that's one that's used for commercial uh, navigation. But non navigable rivers, also have a recreational uh, easement for the river itself. And uh, so uh, after this case, uh, the public was entitled to uh, hunt, fish, uh, swim, or otherwise use the waters between, uh, I guess it's a high, a high water mark on each side and without being guilty of trespass. And that distinction between a recreational use and a commercial use, denoting it as a uh, non-navigable or navigable river was a little different than I had encountered in Arkansas. We've got quite a few cases out here, uh, very unique where you do have these recreational rights along the river, but then it's it's surrounded then by um, private ownership. So getting to the river then becomes the challenge, or you get to it somewhere up or downstream and then can walk the length of the river to then enjoy it uh, recreationally, which has um, stirred some cases up here for sure. Uh, Jerry did just throw a question in here. He he did ask, uh, did the first riparian case occur after you know some random forty days and forty nights of rain? Um, Are you talking about the one I was discussing, Jerry? 
He's no, talking I'm about talking Noah's about, Ark. Talking about the original one. Noah's the, orig- Ark. the original. He's talking Frank. about Noah's Ark. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the high water in that case? <laughs> I don't know. Forty days is that slow and imperceptible? <laughs> that much rain in forty days definitely isn't. See, in in that one, the boundary didn't move. They just moved the landowners to a different parcel. <laughs> Well, they took out all the competition too. There's only one landowner after all that. <laughs> I uh, was pulling up a couple things that uh, David had talked about just from the California state lands, but there was uh, tons of old maps on here that are pretty cool. Uh, recorded in, in 1931, but all over around the San Francisco uh, area, there was one. Here's the where the Golden Gate Bridge would have been built between the two points here. But a couple of really old maps. I threw the link in the chat, but anybody wanted to go look at some old, uh, really cool title maps. And I just want to interject, too. We have a huge California Civil Code that deals with water boundaries, so it's all codified for people. <laughs> so it's not a, I mean, they go they go ahead and assign Civil Code to alluvium and what is the sudden removal of a bank. So there is some clear civil code that's available to guide us and as well as the harbors and navigation code as well yeah our navigability is also codified there's a long list of uh some some law that i've reviewed before i I pull it up when i need to know when i need to test a river but uh, all the rivers are spelled out name by name in california which ones are considered navigable and it's not on the list, then I guess it doesn't count. That that certainly helps. Um, I appreciate that discussion, guys. That's great. That's really informative to bring your guys' expertise in here in the court cases and our understanding from different states. Uh, just one figure I wanted to point out here is, is right under that figure 41A and B. Uh, uh, Waddle states, the vertical difference according to federal laws developed from averages of all tides over an 18.6 year cycle, which is the period of the moon's complete oscillation in relation to the sun and earth. The juxtaposition of three objects affects tidal conditions in different ways at different places. You know, and so that's that. Like I said, I I hear a lot of surveyors or even engineers will say, this is an engineering thing because there's the science to it, right? This this tracking and methodology to it uh, versus kind of some of the stuff we've talked about, whether it's as simple as vegetation or reading the codes. Um, the next section that, that Waddles has in here is meander lines. And if you want a really great discussion about meander lines, uh, back in, I think it's probably October-ish of 2022, as we were going through uh, evidence and procedures, and we went through those uh, the, the riparian portion of that book, uh, John Stahl uh, was kind enough to take over that class and talk about some really unique cases in Utah uh, with meander lines and riparian rights. Uh, and, and so one of the things that I took out of that is, is meander lines are, are merely a representation or approximation of where that water might have been or where the surveyors at the time would have taken their control lines to or their section lines to. But meander lines don't don't connote a boundary right they are just hey here's where we stop tracing this this section line too and it, it may go further in and so in the discussion and the the cases that john brought up there he talked about some stuff in the uh, northwestern corner of uh, the great salt lake where it is flat for miles i mean zero elevation change for miles upon miles and back in the 60s, the, the Great Salt Lake really receded significantly in height and, and it opened up a bunch of areas. And so, uh, you know, the county survey or someone went out there and surveyed and sectionalized a lot of that, you know, and that wasn't under the direction of the U.S. government or the BLM. And, and then all that's been flooded back out and lost. Or he talked about some areas in Utah Lake, central Utah, where People went out and actually created artificial land. And so there was a great discussion there. I, I won't try and, and muddy up what he did, but I'd encourage you guys, if you have any interest in this, he did a great way uh, discussion of some, some riparian right cases in Utah and talked about meander lines uh, quite in depth there. 
Uh, and so that's just another great resource to go back and watch that, that old episode there. Uh, so again, I'm just going to read this real fast. Meander lines, survey lines used to delineate water boundaries, areas called meander lines. Presumably, these approximate the water line, but variations of all amounts are found in comparing physical conditions with the surveyed lines. And I just talked about that. Uh, now he goes quite into depth here about California. Um, and we've talked at length about, about some of the California stuff. Trent shared that the California documents there, the link there. The one thing I wanted to bring up that I just highlighted is... Uh, a federal act, this is on page 6.8. That's uh, the second paragraph down, starts with outside. Outside of the instructions for the survey of public lands, the format to be used for tideland and waterfront descriptions and the surveys therefore have not been clearly defined. One exception was the federal act of May 24th, 1824, which provided that whenever in the opinion of the president, a departure from the ordinary method of surveying land on any river, lake, bayou, or water course would promote the public interest, he may direct the surveyor general in whose district such land is situated to cause the lands to be surveyed in tracts of two acres in width fronting any river on any river, bayou, lake, or water course and running back the depth of 40 acres shall be offered for sale entire on the same terms in all respects as other public lands in the United States. Uh, and so I, again, not having dealt with this, I'm just curious if you guys have ever seen descriptions or cases like that where maybe someone came back in and, and it was worth creating a, a new parcel after others had been created. We're seeing these, these 40 acre pieces. Okay, maybe just a little rare, a little outside of our, our normal our normal use. Um, that's most of what I had out of the California section here. Um, I'm jumping over to 6.1, we get into natural boundary lines. And we talked about this already that that a water water course is the only natural boundary line that could change over time. Um, and I'll just read what he says here relative to the true position of any water boundary line is the need to determine where it was in its last natural state. This requires historic research of such items as floods meteorological phases. The beginning of artificial conditions, surveys, surveyors field notes. The solution is neither simple nor direct and should be coupled with legal counsel. Any unnatural conditions resulting from dredging and filling, the establishment of groins, bulkheads, or piers, etc., are not acceptable per se for ownership, lines without suitable agreements or court case decisions. And we talked a little bit about that already. Uh, submerged lands. We've talked about this. Who has rights to the 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 submerged lands of the navigable and non-navigable river? Um, and this is short enough too. I'm just going to read through here and kind of give some some clarification what he says. The submerged lands and soils under tide water held in trust for the people of the state are subject to improvements in the interest of commerce and navigation by either the federal government or the state or a county or city holding such areas in trust for the state and without the exercise of the power of eminent domain. Therefore, any evidence of title describing tide land should contain an exception of rights and easements for commerce, navigation, and fishery. The third district court of appeals in New Jersey did, however, hold that federal rule under the River and Harbors Act contemplated that lines established for fill constituted abandonment abandonment of the rights of commerce, navigation, and fishery. In areas where artificial lakes have been created, the rights of the public to fish therein, and in some cases, the right of commerce and navigation too, have been established and held in the same manner as previously, previously stated for other conditions. And I think that's where we see a lot of, at least in Utah State National Parks, we've got quite a, 
quite a lot of reservoirs that become public lands and trusts, uh, you know, they're held for different types of water uses, and then they begin able to be enjoyed by the public um, and being held and, and maintained typically by the state park um, in that case. Have you guys ever dealt, I'm dealing with a case right now, um, not too far from me, where the boundary is to a reservoir, to the boundary of a reservoir where they filled it up. And so there's, they're, they're retracing the boundary of the reservoir. And I've got a, a, a boundary dispute case coming up right up against it. And it's been pretty interesting to, to, to chase that. So I figured I'd throw that out here um, under our submerged lands where uh, section corners have been lost, property corners have been lost. They're all submerged and underneath. And what have you guys done? What have you guys seen in those in those cases? And I'll share a couple stories afterwards. <laughs> Quiet Tuesday. I think I'm just optimistic that the Great Salt Lake is going to rise again. And then I'm going to laugh when all the people building out on the west side of the valley are now underwater. <laughs> now, that's not nice, but it's still kind of amusing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so in this case here, uh, I know the BLM is going through, at least the one I'm working on, the BLM is going through and retracing the boundary of the of Pine View Reservoir and they're doing surveys across it. But it, it's, it's interesting because that was, I mean, there's homes underwater there. I mean, there's section corners that are now lost underwater. Um, and that dates back to the, I think it was the 40s or something like that, 40s or 50s when that was filled in. Um, and and the descriptions were 40s and 50 errors descriptions, and they don't they don't line up um, very well, and and occupation doesn't line up with it, and that rises and lowers as as you know. Last year when we saw extensive flooding across the state, they were just dumping water out of there to try and pass water through as it was filling back up as everything melted. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how all that that ties in together and the submerged lands there and that what opens up. Um, obviously, that gets into the discussion we talked about is mean high, mean high water, right? Where is it normally at and what do people have rights to? But it, it is a challenge to then go survey it because the fences that were put along the reservoir don't match the deeds, you know, and, and we've kind of talked about, okay, well, the deed holds. Uh, but what was intent and the fen fences don't match the deeds or occupation don't match you, you know, that gets into an interesting discussion, you know, of, of what the actual boundary is. So I'm really glad that they're going through and um, re-monumenting the limits of this, this artificial body of water, you know. And again, the, the deeds don't necessarily call to it because they were all taken, they were purchased or, or um, taken as part of eminent domain, but the, the boundaries of this lake were, were established. Um, but we were doing easement work up in Idaho, uh, up in the Island Park area, and that was another interesting one where you've got some artificial bodies of water not far from there. And uh, I unfortunately didn't get to be part of this, but we actually went out with scuba gear. Our survey teams went out with scuba gear and found some old stones that were, you know, about 150 feet from the shoreline and, and maybe five or six feet deep and and were able to reestablish some critical boundaries because they found the original stones that were were buried. Um, and so that was a unique exercise in retracement surveying for sure. Okay, Jim went over here then, ownership projected into tideland areas. Um, I just highlighted here really fast, a couple sentences in. Um, I'll just start from the beginning here. There are so many varied conditions in the configuration of tidelands and flats that many rules have been formulated in efforts to provide some semblance of fairness in the distribution of them to the adjoining upland owners. And the following area, the following are quotes of some of those rules as cited in Corpus Juris Volume 9. Um, and that's what I highlight here. The rule for the division of flats is to run perpendicularly to the shoreline from the point of division at high water mark to low water mark. Each proprietor of, proprietor of original tracks takes between the lines of his new frontage on the water course measured back to the old frontage. 
course or direction of said lines is of no consequence. The extent of old frontage on the water course determines the extent of the new frontage. Um, and so if we jump over to the, you know, just the next few pages to finish out this chapter, they give all these unique examples of how you might break this down. We went, again, we went into a lot of this discussion in our evidence and procedures class, but how do you then determine property property ownership through submerged lands, taking, you know, an aliquot park type description and moving it out into water. I did throw the link in the chat, but for those watching later, it's chapter eight of evidence procedures. Everything's on the Wisdom Wednesday's website, but so. Thanks for grabbing that, Trent. Yep. <clears throat> they were wondering where you are at your conference. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, thoughts here, we got quite a bit of discussion of, of, of hows and whys here, but as we look at these figures, um, so let's just jump in, if you don't mind, up to 44A. It's got Brown, Stutz, Smith, and Kruger, and I actually think uh, uh, evidence procedures use some of these exact images, if I remember correctly. <laughs> they, they look very similar to that, um, you know, so we've got our high water, our low water mark, and, you know, let's just look between Brown and Stutz, right? They've got three lines going out there of how you might be able to then uh, break those lines down. Any thoughts on that? Have you guys ever had to retrace something like this and figure this it out? Is, <clears throat> this can be like similar to like uh, uh, easement or road reversion where you're extending lines out also. Uh, typically on a road, you use a straight line extension. The problem with that is, uh, with waterways, is if you've got a, a waterway that, that winds around a lot, you could wind up with adjacent lines crossing each other, which is why uh, the Long Lake method typically uses perpendicular to the either the center line of the waterway or the tall wig, the deepest channel. Uh, I think some of those those figures that are in there, like 44B and on, I think those are pretty much straight out of the manual of instructions, uh, the ones that show the sections, because they describe like using the uh, long lake method for long narrow bodies of water, and then at the ends, using the pie method, which goes radial lines to the center, the deepest point of the, of the, of the round part of the stream. So it, it, a lot of it's at, at the discretion of, you know, what the what the survey thing is most equitable. Yeah, you can also do equal, equal proportional distances, shoreline distances. You know, what was the proportion of the original shoreline to the new shoreline that's created when you extend the line? So that, that's a lot of really iffy stuff there. It's, it's real, it can be pretty confusing. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is like on that 44B um, in section 23 on the, the bottom side or the south side of the, I guess, lot three of, yeah. of, of this river, right? Like that lot three seems to be getting a, a pretty large area when you kind of look at it um, compared to, to some of the other ones like lot four, right? Again, the center line for the width of that river waterway seems to narrow there, but you'd almost think that you want to connect lot three to lot one to the north and just create this this straight line one. And so there is quite a bit of of research and understanding of of what they intend to do, how to keep it equitable in how you break this down. And so that it, like Jerry said, this is all in the manual of instructions. And there's quite a bit that goes into that. Um, I don't know if we have any CFEDS people on here, how much CFEDS gets into some of this stuff. Um, I guess Dave, you got David, you got your hand up. Go ahead. We uh, we've got one river, the Arkansas River, that uh, has shifted a lot over the years, and <clears throat> the way Arkansas law deals with accretion, uh, each boundary owner is entitled to take at such time as he wants to a equitable amount of the accretion. And that's not stated in the law as exactly how that will be. 
there's more than one way to divide this Cretan area and say that it was uh, equitable. The thing about it is, once a person has, a landowner has claimed that accretion area, whether he wants to do it once every year, once every 10 years, once every 30 years, well, as soon as one landowner claims it, the other landowner has to recognize that or else show that it was not equitable. And so uh, it, it kind of falls into who's the first guy on the block there, uh, which makes it kind of easy for a surveyor because if you can determine something by reading cases and come up with something that's an equitable division or that the court will find as equitable, then it is going to be the boundary. And that goes back to law that the person in, in possession, whether it's real or personal property, is entitled to continued possession against the whole world, except for somebody who can show a better title. And where you make a, a where one owner takes a equitable amount of the accretion land, the adjoining owner is it is not going to be able to show a better title and so he must concede to the first person's uh uh line that he is claimed to so uh that's what's going to work in arkansas okay thanks chair james uh david you you had your hand up and and now you mute yourself but uh did you have a question or comment you want to throw throw back out at us? You might take a phone call. Um, also on the CFEDS, there is a question number five is introduction to water boundaries. So there is a there is a CFED section about water boundaries as well. So it's just before subdivision of sections, believe it or not. <laughs> so learn about the water boundaries before you start learning about section breakdowns. That seems a little backwards, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and to, uh, to David's point, a couple of, I was laughing that a couple of these talks about the California uh, survey state exam, and I took it when I'm still a paper exam. But um, one of my questions back then was a breakdown of section six, and it was against the ocean on the west side, against a land rancher on the right and on the east side. And then you had to do this whole subdivision of section six breakdown. It was ridiculous, but but uh, oh, he's got the baby. That's why. That's why. Maybe we're rising. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I had a baby wake up on me. I had to go get her, but uh, I did have a question. Um, sorry to interrupt, uh, Trent. No, we're um, fine. Yeah, we're just killing time. Um, you know, sometimes every now and then, I, it's a very interesting concept, and and I think we've gone through a lot of different. Like, you know, stuff you really have to have your bases covered. We do a lot of research and examination of, of all these situations to, to write a legal description of a water boundary. Um, one thing I've noticed in, re, in you know, reviewing old deeds and stuff that I never quite understood um, is that every now and then I'll see one where they say, you know, we're going to the center line of, of, Smith Creek as it existed on January 12th, 1943. And I find that kind of notation helpful because it sort of gives me a, a, some provenance of the deed and when it was written and stuff, when usually half the time you don't know when it was written or who wrote it or anything. But I don't, I never really understood the significance of the date of this is where the creek was on this date because we, I think we, we've just covered that if, if it moved in the last 75 years, then, you know, the center line of where it was on 1943 is irrelevant because it might be in a different spot now, or maybe it's in the same spot. So do you guys know why they might put that date in there in the, in the deed when describing a, uh, what would that, that would be a, a riparian boundary, right? On a Creek, a non-navigable Creek. 
I wonder if that has to do with anything just like any other deed or, or reference, right? Trying to put a time frame to it, you know, that that this is what it is at this moment in time, just in case there was any question. You know, when I reference a a recorded deed, you know, I, I try and put a, a date, you know, entry number da, 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 recorded this time to kind of give some perspective or some ease in finding information about it. Uh, Jason threw in the, the chat here, junior senior rights, uh, you know, you're able to track that. Well, when when you've got uh, an old lead there that, that made a reference to the uh, center line of a creek and a date along with it, well, that's important because what happens if you have an artificial change there, if it's in farming country, and somebody digs a uh, canal that replaces that that creek, and it just slowly becomes silted in or farmed over or whatever, and is no longer recognizable. The uh, the artificial canal is not going to replace the boundary. You've got to go back to where it was in the first location. And do and go from there as best can be done. So in that respect, uh, uh, that deed and its reference to a creek at a certain date could be uh, really uh, relevant to what you need to do. So does that matter? Like, if the channel was on that date at that time. And even though it, you know the river's moved, or there's more water in the river at the time than the the river is moved to the north, they still own to that nineteen whatever channel. Then would they no. still own to that? No, no. Okay. If 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 the channel moves gradually, or moves by natural forces, then the boundary moves with it. Okay. But if that boundary is replaced by an artificial canal that merely takes the place of that creek in a different location and the creek becomes obliterated, then uh, the, the, the boundary doesn't move to the artificial canal. That would be my understanding. Correct me if somebody else feels different. If it's a modern day act that you're creating an artificial canal versus a, a historic creek, you would think that there's some sort of deeds or transfers or easements or something that gets recorded along with that, um, at least in my mind, that would help solve that. Um, historically, it's a tougher question. Um, if there aren't anything to back it up. It would be odd to cut someone off or grant someone extra land. Not sure without getting into that one. It's a good question though. I think I like the the uh, explanation that James offered. You know, it's, it seemed to me like it was just a retracement of the center line and you go out there and you know, retrace it again 50 years later and find either find the same results or find something slightly different or find something dramatically different. But, you know, it's it's essentially documentation of your boundary. And it seems like that would be the responsible thing to do. But it's, um, you know, it just it's always kind of puzzled me. But yeah, I think I think uh, James's um, assessment of it seems, seems like that's probably reasonable. Jason just turned the text. The Rio Grande is a great example. Massive floodplain management systems that constructed lots of canals and diversions, et cetera. The river is still there, sort of. Okay, awesome. Great discussion, guys. I appreciate it. I just uh, drove past and over the Rio Grande. They got it shut off. I guess they shut it off for like three months during the winter and have it all dammed up. But it was, it was as bone dry as you could see 
in and all through Las Cruces and that kind of stuff. I was just there Sunday, but yeah, it's pretty wild. It's bone dry, even uh, down through El Paso and all that. There's there's no water whatsoever. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. A beach, not 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 exactly. Yeah, it's pretty close. <laughs> it's pretty close, <laughs> but close. Yep. Okay, well, let's jump in here. We talked quite a bit about lake boundaries or the Toro lines in some of our discussion here. So I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit further here. And let's get into just some vocabulary here. Talk about our, our test prep. Um, there's a BLM manual of terms. There's, there's quite a few uh, uh, vocabulary books out there that are really great to prepare for the test. Um, so 617, I'm going to start at 617 here, Trent. So we, we've used these words. And, and hopefully, if you haven't heard these before, you're in the background quickly Googling them uh, so you can keep up with the conversation. But that was always a hard thing when we start using these, this jargon as a young surveyor. And, and I don't want to look dumb, but I have no clue what anyone's saying. Luckily, we've got smartphones today to start like in the background looking this stuff up. But uh, <clears throat> we will go through a few of these. Um, so accretion. And I'm just going to read these so I don't murder this, but uh, accretion is the act of growing to a thing usually applied to the gradual and the imperceptible accumulation of land by natural causes, as that of a sea or river. Alluvian, Black does not list alluvium, <coughs> excuse me, but Webster shows alluvium, alluvium equals alluvium, is that increase of the earth on a shore bank of a stream or the sea, by the force of water as by a current or by waves, which is so gradual that no one can judge how much is added at each moment of time. Um, reliction, relic, reliction is an increase of, switch pages here, of land by the permanent withdrawal or retrocession of the sea or a river. Um, and then he, he gives some rules here. Uh, the distribution of that land, which is added to water boundary, property follows several different rules. And again, you must discover which one is applicable to your particular case. The allotment of the land, so added to fresh water boundaries adheres to the format of proportioning and follows one of these rules. Uh, proportionate acreage based on the direct relationship to the area held by each respective owner. This gets into what we were just talking about before of how to correct these lines. Proportionate shoreline distance, whether it be straight, convex, or concave, based upon direct relationship to the frontage. Proportionate thread of the stream measurement, similar to two, uh, to two above, based on its direct relationship to the frontage held by each respective owner at the time of conveyance. Or around a generally circular lake, the center is established by first and line, established first, and lines are drawn from it to the side limit of each property where they intersect the original peripheral boundary. This is also known as the pie method. Uh, five, where a lake is elongated and perhaps also irregular, a combination of the thread of the stream and the pie method is used in the main portion. Lines are drawn from the property corners perpendicular to the thread of the lake, similar to the thread of the stream, in that it is a line midway between the opposite shore lines taken the long way of the lake while the concave ends are cut into sectors by the pie method. Avulsion, jumping out of this, this explanation back to our, our vocabulary, avulsion is a removal of a considerable quantity of soil from the land of one man and its deposit upon or annexation to the land of another suddenly by the, by the perception, perceptible action of water because the change is not gradual and imperceptible the ownership does not change and follow the new water lines. In other words, if a river had formed an oxbow, uh, but during the flood event, it jumped across and cut it off, the owner would retain the part of, on the other side of the new river bed. The original lines remain as they existed prior to the avulsion. <coughs> Erosion, the gradual eating away of the soil by the operation of currents and tides. Um, I think that was all the big vocabulary words. We threw out Thalweg. Thalweg is that the 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 lowest point in a and trended. I don't know if you had one that showed the Thalweg there to kind of describe that, but it's the lowest point of the river. 
Any other vocabulary guys, words you guys used or heard that regard um, riparian rights? The thread of the stream, the line midway between the banks or the line equidistance from the edge of the water on the two sides of the stream at the ordinary stage of the water. Okay, great. You even came with the definition. Thanks, Teresa. I got my book out. <laughs> <laughs> Good. The, yeah, there's, there's the fall way, the, two, the line between the two lowest points there. Scarp, there's another one there that was on that image, the scarp. I, I've seen in some states where the tall wig and the thread are defined as the same thing. So <clears throat> you got to be careful on that. Again, that's a jurisdictional thing. Um, that's, that's more or less correct for Arkansas. We have cases in, uh, that mention the thread and also the tall wig. Big. Uh, but it's the tall bag, uh, I think, that's really carries the weight in Arkansas. Um, and But I have seen cases where the thread is defined as the midway point between the ordinary low water marks in Arkansas cases. So nothing's really very clear in Arkansas. They don't make it easy. For one thing, uh, uh, rivers in Arkansas are not labeled uh, navigable or non-navigable, and you have to wait until there's a court case. The court has to rule whether it is or it isn't. So, uh, and, and there have been places where uh, a river has been labeled navigable in some areas and not navigable a short distance away. So. Uh, it just you know you got to flip a coin sometimes and, and uh, cross fingers and pray that you're getting it right. <laughs> yeah, that Weber River I was talking about is the same way. It's navigable some places and nav non-navigable others. Yeah, there's there's points of that river that are 200 feet wide and the water is all essentially underground, and there's portions of that that are 10 feet wide and. 10 feet deep. I just like uh, saying Talbeg and, and watching people try to sound it out because it's not said the same way you see it. <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there a problem? I see, I've always said it Thalweg because it's TH, but it's I've heard it's it. Every T. It's, it's without the H. It's a hard T. It's a hard Thalbeg. T. Thalbeg. Okay. Uh, like. Hey. Like veg, ve, v like vegetable, tall veg. Yeah, it's German. German, okay. I see. I, I've I've definitely learned a lot today, but that's a great way to cap it off. I know we're just a little short of the hour here, but we are to the conclusion. And and Waddles just kind of ends this chapter with talking about, hey, if you if you come into these situations where you're dealing with riparian boundaries and you're not quite sure. Uh, what to do, you know, your your state lands commission um, is, a, is a great way to start. Look at the local laws, the local governance of, of who, who has those rights and start there is a great way to start doing research. Uh, definitely there are surveyors that do this more often um, and, and deal with it rarely. So those would be another great resource to reach out to. Um, and of course, these books, we've got some resources here and links here that are some great ones to start doing research on. Um, and so those are just some ways to kind of figure this out. Um, and that's all I had for tonight. Any other questions, comments, or vocabulary from anybody? No, I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, we've got our UCLS conference and fundraiser this week. So uh, Jeremiah will be down here. If anyone else wants to start the drive, you guys are more than welcome to come join us. It's Love it, perfect okay. golf weather. Enjoy the conference. It's not, it's rainy and miserable down here, Jeremiah. Only today, <laughs> only today. Yeah, hopefully you know, the rest I have my clubs though. So <laughs> right, you and I need to come meet down here and go, go 
golf uh the no what's the new one down here black yeah, black rock black rock before it gets too expensive we need to find a time to come do it it's on my list done okay have a great right. night everybody bye guys